Jody Avergan here. I'm glad you're enjoying 30 for 30 podcast, part of a special collection of sports audio documentaries from ESPN Films. We're finding the best sports stories for you right now. And to do that, we're behind the wheel of the new Mini Countryman, the biggest Mini yet. Please proceed to the highlighted round. To find great sports stories, you have to get out into the world and follow your instincts. That's where the new Mini Countryman's all-wheel drive comes in handy. With all four, we can chase down a story in the city, the country, and most places in between. Podcast equipment isn't very bulky, but even if we're hauling a lot of gear, there's plenty of cargo space for all your stuff. And if a few of our producers tag along, no problem. The Mini Countryman comfortably seats five adults. The Countryman may be big, but it still drives like a Mini thanks to the twin power turbo engine. No matter what story you're chasing, the new Mini Countryman will help you find it. It's available now, and so are 30 for 30 podcasts. Visit miniusa.com slash newcountrymen today. Hi, it's Greeny, and this is something special we share with our podcast listeners. Season 2 of 30 for 30 Podcasts is coming right around the corner, specifically November 14th. And where better than within our ESPN podcast, including Mike and Mike, to debut the trailer for Season 2, as well as share with you one of our favorite episodes from Season 1, The Fighter Inside. If you haven't already, now is the time to subscribe to 30 for 30 Podcasts. So without further ado, here's a preview of what's coming from Season 2 of 30 for 30 Podcasts. First time I saw that photo, I sort of recoiled. I sort of physically moved back from my telephone with a whoa. Returning this November, ESPN Films critically acclaimed 30 for 30 podcasts. If this photo and if this moment was the um, rekindle of the fire for athletes to speak upon things, then um, I guess we did our job. <laughs> This season, we have a new lineup of audio documentaries, including the inside story of how the hoodie became a symbol for justice. We can't help Trayvon now, but how can we help his family out? You know, me, LeBron, Chris, all of us felt a certain way. But what do y'all want to do about it? We'll look at how unlikely innovators... Hi, everyone. Welcome to John Madden Football. ...built sports juggernauts. If I'm going to be paying a royalty on a football game, then I want the biggest name I can get. And it wasn't that hard to figure out that it was John Madden. And the turbulent origins of a billion-dollar empire. I got the T-shirt says there are no rules. What are the rules that we need to talk about? Hey, the UFC can start right here, right now. I'll take your brother on right now. I was simply bringing back the glory of the ancient world. How could I go wrong? Come on. We'll explore how daylight became a baseball team's unlikely opponent. The lack of lights at Wrigley Field for night baseball may have been a great tradition, but it was really becoming a detriment to the organization. And pitted the team against some of their biggest fans. Oh, you mean our tradition was always lousy and now you're going to build a new one? And the tale of how a man's unlikely journey to the edge of space. I promised my mother that I'm coming back because I'm surrounded by the best scientists on this planet. Was a bigger challenge than even he could ever imagine. And I'm not going to let my mother down because you guys make a mistake. The second season of 30 for 30 podcast featuring five new stories begins Tuesday, November 14th. But here's a full episode from our first season after a short break. Jody Avergan here. Have you listened to 30 for 30 podcasts from the producers of ESPN's award winning documentary series? It's an amazing collection of sports stories you need to hear to believe. Speaking of amazing, Delta Airlines and the Fly Delta app make your travel experience amazingly easy with real-time bag tracking, e-boarding, and passport scanning during check-in. And don't forget to download 30 for 30 podcasts to fill your flight with stories that will keep you coming back for more. From ESPN Films and ESPN Audio, you're listening to 30 for 30 Podcasts, presented by the Mini Countrymen. Today, the fighter inside. When a professional athlete gets sentenced to prison, it's usually assumed it's the end of his or her career, or at least a major hurdle. But this is the story of a pro athlete who not only managed to compete while incarcerated, he also climbed his way to the top of the sport, without ever stepping outside the prison walls. 30 for 30's Andrew Mambo tells the story of the fighter inside.
looking at the notes here, it looks like I got the case in August 2005. And it looks like they said he was in jail most of his life. In the summer of 2005, a parole officer named Joe McGovern got a case he knew wouldn't be easy. The parolee was a man in his late 50s who had just gotten out of prison after three decades behind bars. At that point, he had done more time in prison than he was on the street. Just the amount of time he did, he, it was going to be hard. The man had no money and no place to live. So Joe helped him find a room in a subsidized building right next to a soup kitchen in Trenton, New Jersey. And the man would show up at Joe's office a lot. Usually we're, we're looking for parolees. We were trying to get him not to come in. It got to a point where I said to myself, I, I got to fill this guy's day. Something else has to be going on. One thing the man loved was boxing. He was always telling stories about his days boxing in prison. It gave Joe an idea. He knew a boxing club in South Trenton, close to where the man lived. I, I stopped in there one day, told him I was from parole, and I says, hey, I got a former boxer that you guys are looking for any work, you know? And he said, nah, we're not going to pay nobody. You know, we, we don't have that. And I says, well, I says, um, could he come in and hang out or volunteer or something, you know? Well, he, he gave me like a, oh, no, you know, I don't know. And then he says, well, who do you have? I, I didn't use his name at first. And I says, it's James Scott. And man, he, he said, what? He turned around and just like yelled it out to a couple guys there. James Scott is around. Well, it was like, um, you got James Scott, are you serious? And you gonna bring him here? Oh, that's great. Eric Judkins was one of the trainers there. I mean, anybody would be excited to have James Scott. He's a legend. I saw these guys' reactions, and I was like, wow. He, it was probably like I walked in with Muhammad Ali, and I, I had no, no idea who I had. Let's hear it for great Scott, super Scott. James Scott. What the guys in the gym knew is that in the late 1970s, James Scott was one of the best light heavyweight boxers in the world. And what makes James unlike any other boxer before or since is that he was a convicted felon who fought his biggest matches inside a maximum security prison. Live from Railway State Prison, he trains here, he eats here, he sleeps here. This man, James Scott, the most feared boxer in the light heavyweight division, returns. <laughs> James Scott didn't start his boxing career in prison. He started in the famous Fifth Street Gym in Miami, where Muhammad Ali had come up. We're going to be talking sports. The phone number to call in and talk boxing with our guest Hank Kaplan will be 284. By the fall of 1974, James was undefeated after 10 pro fights. And boxing experts like Hank Kaplan were predicting big things. And they have James Scott, who was definitely on his way to becoming a contender for the light heavyweight championship. This was a new life for James Scott. As a teenager in Newark, New Jersey, he spent years in juvenile detention. At age 21, he'd gone to prison for armed robbery. But now he was 27 years old, out on parole, and winning fights. Things were going great. But then, on a trip home to New Jersey in May 1975, James Scott got in trouble again. James was accused of robbing a drug dealer and murdering his own accomplice. He flat out denied the charges, but his car was spotted at the scene and a witness ID'd him. His murder trial ended in a hung jury, but he was found guilty of the armed robbery charge and sentenced to 30 to 40 years in prison. And James Scott's professional boxing career would almost certainly have ended there, were it not for this man, Bob Hatrack. I had known James Scott for a long time. He was a young, wild guy, just always in some kind of trouble, but he loved boxing. Hatrack was the warden at Rahway State Prison, a tough maximum security prison where inmates had staged a massive riot two years before Hatrack took over the job. The hostages were released at about 10 o'clock last night and taken away in ambulances. That was as bad as Attica. The rebellion erupted after a movie attended by 600 prisoners. They began rioting last night in a demand for reforms, later seizing the warden and several guards as hostages. It was a bad deal, and I, I was determined that that was never going to happen on my watch. But Hatrack wasn't a traditional warden. It would have been easy for me to go to Rahway and feel good about how I was really able to keep people confined and, and how tough I was. You know, that, None of that appealed to me. You know, I didn't put him there. The courts put him there. 
it was my job then to get them ready to go out in the society and stay out and to earn a living and to do all the kinds of things that I could think of doing to make that happen. Under Hat Rack, the prison offered vocational programs like barbershop training and auto mechanics. And then he got an idea to start a boxing program. Not just a recreational program, lots of prisons had those, but a school where inmates would train to become cut men, referees, cornermen, and boxers. For that, he needed a partner, and he knew James Scott was coming to Rahway. I didn't want Scotty there if he didn't have anything positive on his mind because he could be a real troublemaker. So when Scotty came to Rahway, I told him, Scotty, what? here's your job. You're a boxer and you want to box and fight. I want to start a school. And I got to get inmates into that school. And I got to get somebody who can train them in all of these things. And I don't know anybody. And you know all of these people. Start calling around and see if you can get anybody to help us. James agreed. And with that, the Rahway Boxing Association was born. And soon word got around that James Scott, a legit boxer, was at the center of it. And what is your title and what do you do? <laughs> I'm the greatest promoter of all times. <laughs> Murad Muhammad was just starting out as a boxing promoter when he got a call from an inmate saying he had to come to Rahway to see James Scott. What he saw blew him away. He was built like Hercules. I said, excuse me. I said, how you build your body like that? I do a thousand push-ups a day. I said, you do a thousand push-ups a day? Yes, a thousand sit-ups. I said, my God, can you fight? He said, yes, I can fight. Can you promote? I said, we have something here. He was a body puncher, sensational body puncher. He didn't believe he could be beat. We called him the Great Scott. Bob Hatrack knew firsthand how sports could be a way out. The warden had grown up poor and went to college on a baseball scholarship. But his dream of being a professional ball player died after he lost his hand in an industrial accident while working his summer job. And I guess that probably shaped me because I was, I was always for the underdog. Always. No matter what I was watching or doing, you know, I was always, I was always for the underdog. And as far as I was concerned, those inmates were all underdogs. I mean, nobody wanted to do anything for or with them. So when a guy describing himself as the greatest promoter of all times showed up at Rahway, ready to get James Scott back in the ring, Hatrack wasn't about to stand in James's way. He, he needed an opportunity. He needed somebody to, to care about his being able to pursue his dream, and that was to be a boxer. And it was my job, I thought, to care. All of us even trained. We were doing a 1,000 push-ups a day. Keith Hill is a former inmate at Rahway and also took part in the boxing program. In the morning, we would run. James's thing was he wanted to run for an hour. You run for an hour nonstop, you're running. Walter Berry, another former inmate, remembers a time when the group was running in the prison yard after a rainstorm. James was so focused, he wouldn't break formation. And at the end of the running, James made it known to everybody. Yeah, you see that? I, I, I stepped right in that puddle. I lost my shoe, but I didn't stop. <laughs> and what was so funny, everybody was like, well, why you didn't go around the puddle, brother? But that was James's tenacity. You know, that in James's mind, he will let nothing stop him. That was a part of the way he fought. While James was training, Murad was working to line up a fight, a big one with the number one ranked light heavyweight contender, Eddie the Flame Gregory. To make the fight work, he'd have to bring in some serious money. And since only about 450 people could fit in the prison auditorium, the money from ticket sales wouldn't be enough. I have to pat my own self on the back and give myself accolades that I knew this is it. I have to take it to a higher level. And that's when I walked into HBO. So we were approached, and I believe it was Murad Muhammad who was the promoter. David Meister was running the sports department at HBO. The subscription channel was still new, so it was looking for any way to stand out from the networks. And he said, listen, we have this fight, and we sat down and we started talking about it, and then came this little tiny wrinkle. By the way, it has to be done in Rahway State Prison. And that was both off-putting and intriguing and enticing. And exactly what HBO wanted. 
HBO was really looking to, you know, do things that other people weren't doing that would get attention. So we went, sure. Tim Brain was the fight's producer. I was surprised, frankly, that they would allow a television crew to come in and do a fight in a prison. It just seemed kind of crazy to me. And why didn't they just let them out for the day and, uh, you know, fight at the garden or someplace? Um, but they weren't going to let them out. They said, but you can come here. Murad took the plan back to prison officials. I said, gentlemen, I got something going to blow your mind. They said, what, Murad? I said, we're going to bring the network live with their cameras here at Rawway State Prison. Lo and behold, Murad was able to land an Eddie Gregory fight. I don't know how he was able to do that, but he did. And Hatrack says, what network? I said, HBO. Which knocked my socks off. I figured, how in the world could that possibly happen? It's because he was fighting Eddie Gregory, and Eddie Gregory was a big deal. And no one agreed with that more than Eddie Gregory. I'm number one contender in the world. I'm beating all these good guys, and you know. James had been trash talking the best boxers in the division to lure them into the ring. When you hear about another guy that's bragging, he can do this, he can do that. I'm from the hood. You don't call me out, and and I don't answer. So the fight was set. The warden knew he was taking a risk by allowing spectators, the national press, and expensive TV equipment into his prison. But for him, it was worth it. What better way to get the word out than to be on national television? It was another way to expose some of the things that we were trying to do and give Scott some exposure. Had I felt that there was going to be any hint of any kind of problem, I would have never done it. First of all, I'll never forget when the, when the doors shut behind us when you walk in. Ross Greenberg was one of the HBO producers who went to Rahway to get footage in the weeks before the fight. You know, you, you're told by the guard, okay, come on in, and they open it, and then it shuts behind you, and you immediately get this chill. The warden was a pretty progressive guy, but they're very careful in, you know, maximum security prisons. Producer Tim Brain. Really, really, really careful. There would be a guard assigned to every single production person that was going to step foot in the prison. Um, and any equipment that would come in would have to be checked in. Ladders and wires and ropes and cords and things that inmates could steal that they could use for escapes. And we had a list. We had to check every piece of equipment in individually, then check it out at the end of the night. And we had to make sure there was nothing missing. The last thing you'd want is a 30-foot rope left behind somewhere, and a week later you find somebody went over the wall. <laughs> Hatrack took the risk even further. He'd allow the other thousand inmates to be out of their cells to watch the fight live on big screens in the rec center, which he says made the higher-ups nervous. They didn't know what I knew. I knew my population and I knew my officers. I felt nothing was going to happen inside that prison that night. There was just too much to lose. For everybody. Good evening, everyone. My name is Len Berman, working tonight with Don Dunphy, Larry Merchant, and Sugar Ray Leonard. Now, the October 12th, 1978. Which is the site Fight of day. Riots. We are all about to witness an event that's never happened before in television sports a top boxing contender coming inside the walls of a prison to fight an inmate, the inmate James Scott. The, the atmosphere had been building. I wasn't even fighting, and I had butterflies. Everybody was tuned in. You know, to be excited about something happening in a prison is a rare event. I mean, it is a rare event. Everybody was talking about the fight. The same way you have the betting odds in Las Vegas, you had the betting odds in the prison at that time. But for cigarettes. You know, we learned earlier that here at prison, the betting line is three cartons of cigarettes to one in favor of Gregory. <laughs> <laughs> There's no sentiment when it comes to betting. <laughs> they had their, their bets, and, man, James going to win. Man, I'm going with Eddie Gregory. He's not going to beat Eddie. Eddie a bet. That's a pro. He ain't gonna, he's just a jailhouse fighter. Even the guards that didn't like James, they loved the idea that the fight was on. Even the ones that hated him. Even the ones that would do something if they could to stop it. They were still caught up in the moment, in the atmosphere. It was not prison anymore. This was something else. This was not prison. 
He was excited. This was a dream come true. This is everything he wanted. Even when he was winning his fights on the streets, he wasn't on this level. Finally, it was time. James Scott, his trainer Deke Taylor, Murad Muhammad, and the rest of the entourage began their walk to the prison auditorium. James was like, come on, let's go. And he put his hands on my shoulder and said, let's go. Man, it's time. Let's do it. And Deke was there saying the same thing. All right, James, let's do it. In the blue corner, he's from Newark, New Jersey. Let's have a nice hand for the challenger, James Scott. Scott. James stands in the ring, inside the same auditorium where the inmates had started a riot seven years earlier. And in the red corner... He's from the Brownsville section of Brooklyn, the number one World Boxing Association, light heavyweight contender, Henry the Flame Gregory. If you were to ask me, has Scott got much of a chance, I'd say, have to say off the cuff that I don't think so. I just can't conceive of an inmate in a prison uh, defeating the uh, number one light heavyweight contender. The bell rings. Immediately, James is bouncing around like he's nervous, wound up. He's chasing Eddie. And at first, Eddie looks like he's got this. Scott has been very wild so far, and Gregory has boxed beautifully. Now Scott is hitting harder, and he's finding Gregory. Gregory will find out that he just cannot coast along. He'll have to fight. That was a good shot by Scott. That'll make Eddie think a little bit. I seen Eddie Gregory slip some punches that another man would have got beat to death with. And Gregory was good. Gregory beat a joker up. But Gregory was trying to survive. There's the bell. I tell you, if Scott can continue that pace, Eddie has his hands full. At one point, Eddie's on the ropes. James drops his hands, leans in. Always the showman, he's taunting Eddie. Scott is putting on a show. The guys in the prison knew him as Rajan, James Scott's Muslim name. And that's what they were chanting. They weren't chanting James Scott. They was chanting Rajan, Rajan, Rajan. Scott again will not let Gregory get started. Scott is completely dominating the fight. I'll tell you, this is a testimony to what Will can do for a man. It's a remarkable story. A guy incarcerated, unable to go outside and do long road work, go up hills, down hills, and he's about to knock off the number one contender. There's the final bell. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention please. The winner, by unanimous decision, James Scott. Eddie goes over to congratulate James. And even though James is a winner, announcer Larry Merchant's questions are to Eddie. Eddie, was he tougher than you could have imagined a man who's been in prison for as long as he has? Well, I always knew he was going to be tough, you know. I gave him, he got a lot of credit. Were you nervous coming in here to prison? Oh, no, I'm never nervous, you know. I'm a fighter, you know, why should you be nervous? James pushes his way to the mic. And I I want you to put this in the papers. I want you to let me finish. I want this in writing. After I knock out Rossman, I'm going to give Gregory a rematch because he gave me a shot. And he would, nobody else would do it. Gregory got the first shot at the title. The first shot. That's my word. That's my bomb. Were you ever tired? It looked in the middle of the round that you might be a little tired. Okay, now I'm going to tell you the truth. After I dug that I couldn't knock Gregory out like I planned, the best thing for me to do, being that he's a knockout puncher, is to play tired. Because if you notice, every time it looked like I was tired, I come back with a flurry. So I fought my pace, clinching, holding, and kicking his behind. <laughs> Were you aware that he needed a knockout in the last few rounds? I told him in his ass, asked him, he's right over there. I said, boy, you need a knockout to win this here. What over can here. you do for a celebration here? What kind of celebration will you have? Mr. Hadrack and them got a steak dinner for me downstairs. That's my celebration. We've seen a rather historic night here in boxing annals. The walk back to three wing for James Scott won't be so long tonight. The prison was on fire. When James won, the guests were leaving the, the prison. The prisoners were coming down to the cells to lock in. And they were all chanting, Rajan, 
garage. I mean, the whole prison was reverberating. It was almost like you could feel the energy in your feet, the vibration. I'm sure I was in the office when I heard the result, and the first reaction I had was, wow, Eddie Gregory lost? And then you take it a step further and you go, who's James Scott? Then you take it a step further and you go, this fight was at Rahway State Prison? How did that happen? Steve Farhead is a boxing analyst for Showtime. Back then, he was just starting his career covering the sport. Like, if he had been a well-known fighter who had been in prison, I would have said, oh, okay. But because I didn't know who James Scott was, that was what was surprising. We was just watching a Cinderella story unfold, man. Larry Hazard is considered one of the best boxing referees ever. Today, he's the New Jersey State Boxing Commissioner. But early in his career, he was at the Gregory fight, working as the timekeeper. What, what did you think Scott's future was going to be? Oh, I thought he was on his way. He really demonstrated the skill level that said he belonged right there with the top light heavyweight. Murad Muhammad started booking more fights, and major networks like CBS and NBC started airing them. The announcers raved about Scott's relentless style. He's strong, he, he's a good body puncher, crowds you at all times, just doesn't give you a chance to think at all. Scott trains for four minutes instead of three, he rests 30 seconds instead of a minute, he, and he fights with oversized gloves. He will throw everything at you, head, shoulders, arms, just keeps coming, every part of his body utilized. As the warden had hoped, reporters started coming into the prison to do stories on the boxing program. This program is underway because of the inspiration set up by James Scott, a very articulate, sometimes witty, always single-purposed young man who has made good use of his time in prison. He had interviews. He had people used to come up to the cell to do interviews in his cell. He'd be like, oh, man, they're going to see my cell look a mess. No, we don't. No, we don't. <laughs> we in the house, brother. We got this. He was a wild kid, a loser, till he came to prison. Now he has more than 20 college credits and is articulate enough to compare gifted prisoners to unmined nuggets of gold. There's a lot of talent in prison. You got people that can write so good, they make you cry reading and writing. You got people that can draw, can sing, and you got people that can fight. There's a lot of champs in the prison. Eventually, these guys are going back on the street, so they should have some kind of incentive, some kind of hope, something to look forward to when they go back on the street. He was a promoter's dream. Very articulate, very intelligent. And when we talk boxing, you thought you were talking to Muhammad Ali. Are we ready for Yaki Lopez, James? Um, look, Yaki Lopez, I hope you listen, sucker. You pulled out twice for $20,000. And boy, if you're scared to make $20,000, as hard as times is, I know you're scared of me. All right, light heavyweight James Scott, also promoter James Scott, Marv Albert with Ferdy Pacheco. He was very charming, and, and for us, he was like a, a PR machine. When Marv Albert went to the prison to interview James, he'd find himself fielding basketball questions from inmates who knew him as the voice of the New York Knicks. They were very well informed, James and his friends. Uh, so at times you would forget that you were in a prison. It's like you're sitting around with a bunch of guys just talking sports. And, and I think we all felt like this. It was like visiting a kid at camp after we would pack up and get ready to go he, he would stall he would want to show us everything that was in his cell anything to have us stay there beating eddie gregory put james scott on the map he went from a guy boxing in prison to the ninth best light heavyweight in the world all through 1979 he kept winning and since james's fights were on major networks Huge audiences watched as he easily won his next four bouts, climbing higher and higher up the World Boxing Association ranks. Let's hear it for Great Scott, Super Scott, James Scott. He went from number nine right above us and they jump it. In the tenth round, he to number five. Followed by a left. Beautiful comedy. At his ninth knockout, Scott remains undefeated. To number three. Our cards, it's been all Scott thus far. James Scott by TKO, it is all over. And then to two. And a knockout victory for James Scott in the tenth and final round here at Rome. 
James Scott was now the second highest ranked boxer in his division. James Scott is one step closer to the light heavyweight champion of the world. But with recognition came backlash. There were those who thought this is ridiculous and he shouldn't be allowed to do this and he's a prisoner and, you know, how should he be able to get on television? Announcer Tim Ryan called two of James's fights for CBS. There was, there was a lot of commentary and uh, people who objected to the very idea. It wasn't the most popular thing. Boxing Commissioner Larry Hazard. Rawway State Prison? Yeah, this guy's in there making millions of dollars. They don't know. They don't really know the details. James did get paid for the fights, but nowhere near a million dollars. And the money went to the Department of Corrections with strict requirements on how he could use it. For things like paying back the public defender's office, hiring private attorneys, training expenses, and contributions to a crime victim's fund. But those details were never mentioned on TV. And they're looking at that... And they were like, what the hell's going on? Well, we don't want youngsters to think that, you know, you go to prison, you you get on television, you, you know. No, that's not the picture. That's not the story. The lesson here is that he wasn't given up on. Because oftentimes people are just given up on. They're thrown away. I felt that he was defying a belief that he couldn't be something in life. Despite the critics, the networks kept airing James's fights, and ratings were good. But then came an objection that could change everything, this time from the World Boxing Association. I don't know that everybody thought this out all the way through. It seemed like a pretty good idea, you know, televising this guy. Boxing analyst Steve Farhood. But now here he is winning, he keeps winning, and that, now we have to worry about, is he going to fight for a title? Is he going to become a champion? Is the belt going to be behind bars? Whoa, whoa, let's, let's rethink this. In September 1979, at the World Boxing Association's annual meeting, some members raised the question of whether James should be allowed to be ranked at all. The reason a rating is so important is because once he loses that rating, he doesn't qualify for a world title fight. Even if the champion wants to defend against James Scott, if James Scott isn't rated in the top 15, no title fight. The argument was, we are not giving our belt to a criminal. Murad Muhammad was at the WBA meeting when the debate broke out. I said, well, why did you let him go through the rankings? Well, we never thought he would be the leading valuable contender. It's not like they didn't see what was coming. They rated him, they rated him, rated him. He moved up, he moved up, he moved up. What, what did they think was going to happen? Were they secretly praying that he'd lose so that he'd go away? Let me tell you, if you took away the boxing careers of every fighter who had ever been to jail, whether it be pre-boxing, during boxing, or after boxing, you'd have a very different looking sport. So the fact that boxing is worried about the image it's projecting because James Scott is rated number two is kind of silly. I knew that I read the rules. There's no rule on the book says you can't be in jail. Now, you're going to change the rules tonight? Bob Lee then the deputy boxing commissioner for New Jersey, was at the meeting too, and a voting member of the WBA. When you got up in that meeting and spoke, wh what did you say? I, I took the floor and made it known that this was wrong. They were depriving the man of the right that he had to fight for the title when they had given him that right in the beginning. Finally, the vote. Should James Scott be ranked or not? Except for Bob Lee's lone dissent, the decision was unanimous. James was stripped of his ranking. Bottom line is that you know, they just didn't want a guy locked up in prison to have the opportunity to be a world champion. But James wasn't giving up. Today on Sports World, live from the Rawway State Prison, a light heavyweight bout featuring inmate number 57735, James Scott, stripped of his WBA second position ranking in October of this year. Scott faces his toughest test to date in the scheduled 10-rounder with California veteran Yaki Lopez. Yaki Lopez, then the number one contender, was the favorite to win. But on December 1st, 1979, two months after the WBA stripped him, James didn't just beat Lopez, he destroyed him. Now that is it. For James Scott, certainly 
his most impressive performance. He has wanted Yaki Lopez. And uh, you can hear James screaming, I'm the champ. All right, James, in 20 seconds or less, your reaction beating a man that many thought you would not be able to beat in Yaki Lopez. Now, I don't know what I got to do to prove that I'm the world's champion. I think the public should write NBC, and I want you to know that I am the All right, James, champion. we got to sign off. I remember leaving Rahway that day thinking, yeah, this guy could be a light heavyweight champion of the world. The only question was not so much can he be competitive in a world championship fight, but would he get the opportunity? If James had still been ranked, beating the number one contender would have earned him a title fight. But James was stuck. He couldn't fight for a title if he wasn't ranked by the WBA, and he couldn't be ranked as long as his fights were in prison. But James Scott still had one thing going for him. At a time when the light heavyweight division was the toughest and most competitive in history, stacked with past and future title holders, James had still never lost a fight. Was he hopeful that if he kept fighting and he kept winning that he would get the ranking back? Now that I believe. He was going to prove that I'm going to beat everything that Murad brings in here and you will have to give me a shot at the title. It was a good plan. Until he ran into Jerry the Bull Martin. May 25th, 1980. James Scott's ninth professional fight behind bars. Scott's legs looking very wobbly. Very wobbly. I told you that Martin was a sleeper. James met his match. James Scott, who had been knocked down only once before as a professional. James bounced back, even rallied near the end. But it was too late. In a major upset, Jerry the Bull Martin has defeated James Scott here at Railway State Prison. An enormous victory. And here's James Scott to congratulate Jerry Martin. James, your comment. Yeah, Jerry Martin's a damn good fighter, man. He should have had shot me. At least he's out of prison. I'm in prison. He should have got shot before me. He's a damn good fighter, man. God bless him. Can't take nothing from him. And I guess that made it easy for some people when he lost to Jerry Martin because now you didn't have to rate him near the very top and now there wasn't as much of a call for him to fight for a world title. A far more serious loss was still to come. Six years after his first trial ended in a hung jury, James was retried for the 1975 murder. On February 4th, 1981, he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison, though he still maintained he was innocent. I presently in the court the appeal failed. Still, eight months later, James had another nationally televised fight. Scott, an inmate here at Rahway State Prison, he is serving a life sentence for murder and a 30 to 40 year term for armed robbery. James lost. And that turned out to be the last professional fight of his career. Boxing analyst Steve Farhood. He had a great run. He proved he was one of the best light heavyweights in the world. But once that chance of him fighting for a world title was virtually zero, there was no reason for people to pay attention. Then it was much easier to just view him as every other inmate at a maximum security prison, which means forgetting him. One person who hasn't forgotten James Scott is Bob Hatrack, the former warden of Rahway State Prison. Bob's retired. He's 79 now. Not long ago, he ordered a bunch of DVDs of James's fights. I was kind of missing all of that, you know, the, the old days. I was kind of excited to see all of that happening before me again. And the first fight I watched was the Eddie Gregory fight. Scott is completely dominating the fight. I could have very easily not had Scott fight Gregory. All I had to do is tell Murad Muhammad, we're not going to do it. Now, what would that have done? What would that have gained? It would have been writing Scotty off. It would have been like me saying, there's no salvation for you. You can't ever be anything but what you are. I, di I didn't want to go there. 
And the fact of the matter is everybody goes home. Scotty was going to go home. He was going to get parole. There was a time when he was going to leave that place. And as long as we did things during the time that he was there, even if it was a long, long time, all of that would pay off on, you know, on the day that he, that he walked out of the place. In 2005, James Scott did finally walk out of that place, paroled after 30 years. To help him adjust to life on the outside, his parole officer had the idea to take him to a boxing gym. The gym had a strong youth boxing program, and Eric Judkins was one of the trainers. He loved it. You can tell. You can see it in his eyes. He was in his glory right there. I mean, you couldn't put him in a better environment. James gave the kids pointers and encouraged them. He put them through the James Scott conditioning routine. Lots of sit-ups and push-ups. And he had a soft spot for underdogs. Well, you know, if a kid was fat or whatever, and he was like, we're going to trim that down. Or if nobody really paid the kid no mind, he would give that kid some extra attention. Come on, little man, I got you. You know, don't worry about that. We're going to get you in shape. You know, he would do stuff like that. When the kids traveled around the state to boxing matches, James went along too which is how he crossed paths with Henry Haskup. I'm looking at him, you know. Gee, that guy looks familiar. Wait a minute. I said, that can't be James Scott, is it? So I'm looking, looking at him. Man, that looks like James Scott. Henry Haskup is the president of the New Jersey Boxing Hall of Fame. If you just go by his boxing career, you know, he should have been years ago, you know. But um, he had a checkered background, to say the least. And, um, you know, that was one of the things that really held him out for a, for a long time. But then I seen him at a couple of the fights and um, started talking to him. And then I realized that he was actually helping out. Haskup was still wary. Then he started talking to the owners of the gym and the kids and the trainers that work with James. They raved about him and said he was great with the kids. You know, he was teaching them and everything. And, you know, he more or less got his life in, in order. So then when I thought, you know, it's about time, you know, we do the right thing. You know, he's, he's a good candidate. In fact, uh, everybody on the committee voted him in. On behalf of all the members of the New Jersey Boxing Hall of Fame, I want to welcome each and every one of you for coming here this evening to our 43rd annual induction and award ceremony. On November 8th, 2012, James Scott, wearing a black suit with a red polo shirt, stood in front of a crowd of hundreds and was inducted into the New Jersey Boxing Hall of Fame. Founding member of Broadway Prison Boxing Club. While a lot of people called me up, newspaper writers and stuff like that, about him. You know, why was he inducted? You know, you know his past and everything like this. I said, yeah, but do you know what he's done since then? Imagine if he didn't get in trouble. If somebody took him when he was a teenager, when he was going the wrong way, show him the right way. James Scott might have been a household name today. You know, and everybody would know him. Let's hear it for James Scott! I don't think the James Scott story could play out today. I don't think people would be as lenient and as understanding. For that matter, I think without the willpower James Scott had, maybe none of this would have ever happened. Maybe it never would have been launched in the first place. To think of how far this guy took this mission, given his circumstances, was amazing. It throws stereotypes out the window, and it's a lesson, I think, in understanding the kind of man that is behind bars. You just can't generalize. This, um, I'm looking for a patient, James Scott. After I spent months talking to other people about James, his sister Lori said I could finally come and meet him. Hi. How are you? Good, good. Good to see you, good. good I think I deserve you. a hug now. How are you doing? When she takes me over to James, he's in a wheelchair, looking out of a window. This is Andrew, and this is James. Hi, Mr. Scott. It's a pleasure to meet you. I've heard a lot about you. Reaction. He shook your hand. He extended his hand to you. That's a strong grip, too. Yeah. Still, still got that strength in the hands. Yes, yes. <laughs> James turned 70 this year. 
He lives in a nursing home, not far from where he grew up and where he boxed in prison so many years ago. Lori had told me James has late-stage dementia. She warned me I might not get any response at all. But as I talked to him about his career, his eyes meet mine and he seems aware. Uh, I haven't seen him this animated and this engaged in a long time. Now, but it's clear. I'm years too late to interview James Scott about his boxing days. About a few weeks ago, I, I was out visiting with Mr. Hatrack um, that he's been thinking about you, and he recently actually purchased uh, some of the fights that you had in Rawway so he could re-watch them. I had a copy of the DVD from when you were inducted in the New Jersey Boxing Hall of Fame, and, and we played that for him as well so he could see you being inducted into the Hall of Fame. That's good news. Isn't that wonderful? That's good news, Jenny. James opens his mouth to speak. It's a challenge. We lean in as he tries to get the words out. What were you going to say? I'm still not sure what he said. Part of me thinks he was trying to repeat his sister's words, good news. But there's a part of me that thinks he was saying, I didn't lose. Which, in the ring, James Scott really did. This is Rawway State Prison, and I want you people to know at home that if you get up and go get a soda, a glass of beer, go to the bathroom, you might miss it. This is going to be one of the most exciting fights that y'all have seen in a long time. James Scott, the uncrowned light heavyweight champion of the world, said that. Is that convincing? Thanks for listening. My name is Jody Avergan. You can listen to all the episodes from our first season right now at 30for30podcast.com. And remember, our second season of all new documentaries starts on Tuesday, November 14th. Subscribe now in the ESPN app or Apple Podcasts. Behind every athlete, team, or victory is a story. ESPN Films 30 for 30 podcast brings you these stories. There's a story behind Blue Moon. Blue Moon Belgian White, a Belgian-style wit beer, was born in a ballpark. It started as the Sandlot Brewery inside Coors Field at the beginning of the 1995 baseball season. One beer turned into a roster of beers, and the clear fan favorite, then called Bellyside Wit, is known today as Blue Moon Belgian White.